All right, is this thing on? Yay. Okay, so I am down here today. Woohoo! Um, well, I am so glad that I'm here, and I'm so glad y'all are here too. Woohoo! All right, so now, now that everybody has sit down, I need everybody to stand up. Okay, now, it's very important that you do this. So the first thing you have to do is you got to droop your shoulders down and bend forward a little bit, kind of look down, stick out that bottom lip, and say just real miserable, I'm free in Jesus. Okay, one more time, just like that. I'm free in Jesus. Okay, now, arch those shoulders back, put a smile on your face, lift your face to heaven, and let's say it like we mean it. I'm free in Jesus. Okay, one more time. I'm free in Jesus. All right, so you can sit down. And that's just, uh, you know, sometimes we might say the right thing, but it kind of comes out in a pathetic way. And so I'm hoping that's not what's going to happen here today. So, um, Father, I just thank you for this chance for us to come together and to worship you and to just be a part of you and your fellowship. God, I lift up Brian right now as he's struggling with sickness, and I pray for your healing to just wash over him. Lord, for the enemy that's attacking him to be defeated in Jesus' name. And I pray that you would just, uh, your word would go forth and that it would speak and that people would be saved and they would be healed and they would be transformed and they would grow closer in their relationship with you and with each other. God, I just love you, and I give this time to you. I pray you use my mouth to speak your words. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, so I got here this morning, and I uh, found out that Brian was sick, and, and Howard was saying, well, I think I'm going to talk, and I was like, well, cool, because uh, I had, Brian had originally asked me to speak next week, and so I had written some stuff down, and then like this week, as I started to pray about that, I was like, well, God, this doesn't really seem to fit next week. I don't know what I'm going to pray about, so what is it you would have me say? And so I get here, and I, I show Brian, or I show Howard what I was going to talk about, and he's like, well, maybe the reason it didn't fit next week is because you're supposed to say it today. So he went, tag, you're it. And uh, so, you know, I only had like an hour to get nervous. So uh, hopefully you do okay. So last time I had five pages of notes. This time I only have four. Most of them are scripture. So uh, we'll see. Uh, I can talk longer. Don't worry. Uh, once I get going. So uh, this is Boundless by Design series that um, Brian has started off. I think, uh, is anybody even getting anything out of that? Yeah. Am I the only one? <laughs> no? Okay. Anyway, I thought it was really cool, and I've gone back and had to listen to them again, just because, you know, sometimes you don't catch them all the first time. And one thought I had, and you can kind of write this down, it's like, don't let Satan lie to you and have you accept just being less bound. Press into God and strive to be boundless in him. So the enemy will lie and say, oh, one small step for victory, you know, 99 more in bondage or whatever. But we can be free of bounds in Christ, he paid the price for us to be free, not just for us to kind of get by down here and find some good life in the sweet by and by. I believe in the sweet by and by, but I believe in the sweet here and now too. So the passage that I'm kind of basing my talk around is in Song of Solomon. So I don't know if you've ever, um, I don't know that I've ever heard a message from Song of Solomon, but um, I think it's really cool. Has um, if you do any studying in it, like I came across some stuff, and it's like the, uh, there were certain, certain segments of Jewish teachers who was like, you had to be at least 30 years old before they would kind of even let you read it, because you can get messed up. Uh, but the Song of Solomon, very simply, is a love story uh, between a man and a woman, and you can kind of see as you read through it and you read through the rest of the Bible, that it kind of mirrors and it shows the passion that Jesus has for us, his bride, his church. So uh, this is chapter 2. I'm going to start with verse 14. This is the young man talking. Uh, My dove is hiding behind the rocks, behind an outcrop on the cliff. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is pleasant and your face is lovely. And then this is kind of a background chorus who's saying, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grape vines are blossoming. And then the young woman speaks, My lover is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies. 
Verse 15 is what I wanted to uh, catch. I just wanted to, this verse, I just wanted to give you a little context for it. It's in the middle of a love song between a man and a woman that mirrors the love that Jesus has for us and we should have for him. Catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grapevines are blossoming. I don't know, has anybody ever heard the phrase, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine? Anybody? Great, let me see your hands. So a couple of people have. I, I guess I'm just weird because I hear that phrase all the time. And I've heard it all my life growing up. You know, because it's like, if you think about it, it's not like the big, like in, in your budget, it's not the unexpected $1,000 repair or $1,000 expense that kills you. It's the $2 for this soy decaf mocha cappuccino latte thing. It's, it's $2 because you supersized this. It's $5 because you had that extra drink uh, when you were out with friends. It's, you know, you, you got this pastry when you went into the grocery store. And the next thing you know, you come to the end of the week. What happened to all my money? I didn't do anything. You know, it's not like I did. It's like you didn't do any one thing. You did a bunch of little things. And it's those little things that mess us up so we're not prepared when the big stuff really hits us. And we have to be careful about those because if we don't see them, then we're not in place. We're not where we need to be when the big stuff in life comes our way. So, uh, man, I'm really nervous today. So I, I, I want to, um, thank you. I want to tell a little story. I was... Um, I come up to the church a lot just because I love this place. This is like, this is like my favorite place to be. Um, I love the people who come here, all of y'all. I, I, I love everyone. And I have to tell you now because you never hear it from me any other time. I don't talk a lot. I don't say a lot. But I kind of keep to myself. But I was, um, I was looking out over the parking lot. And this was, you know, we really didn't have a winter. We had like summer and then interim and summer. So in kind of the interim... I was looking out over the yard and I was just like, you know, it, it just looks dirty, but I'm looking at, I was like, I really don't see anything. You know, there's just like these three or four big pieces of trash out there. And so, you know, I just kind of looking, looking. I thought, well, you know, I can go pick them up. I don't have to wait for somebody else to do it. So I, I get a trash bag and I walk out. And I mean, you know, and we're not talking like super big things. We're talking, you know, something like the size of a sheet of paper or like an empty cold drink bottle or something like that. So, you know, and there's like, there's one over there, there's like one off to the side, and there's another one there. So I go and I pick up those three things, and then after I pick them up, then I look, and all of a sudden, there's like these seven or eight things that I then see in the yard that they're not quite as big as those, but. I honestly, I could not see them before. They weren't there until I picked up these big things. So then I was like, okay, well, you know, I need to get some steps in today anyway. So I crisscrossed the yard again, and I pick up those, you know, five, six, seven things. And then I look, and I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden there's like these 10 or 12 little tiny things. And at, at this point, I clued in that it was God showing me something. Because, I mean, like, I'm sitting back over here, standing back over here where the little playground area is. And, I mean, halfway up to the road, I see this little bottle cap. I mean, you can't, I mean, it had to be God. And so it's like, I'm walking around, picking, these, picking that small thing up, picking that small thing up. And so I must have crisscrossed the, the yard area like three, four, five times. And whenever I'm done, I've got almost half a bag of trash uh, that, you know, I didn't tie up and throw in the dumpster. And it was just, you know, God was showing me that I didn't notice the little stuff. I couldn't even see the little stuff that was there because I just, I was blinded to it. The only thing I could see were these few big things. I'm like, oh, there's just a couple of things. You know, what does it matter? They're not hurting anything. But when I picked those things up, then I could see the stuff that was a little bit smaller. And then whenever I picked those up, then I could see the stuff that was a little bit smaller. And so I, it's, as I applied that to myself and the things that go on in my life, these little things come and happen. 
you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic. I'm sure I'm the only one that's ever happened to. And you know, and you know, you don't say bless you, but that's what you meant to say. You know, sometimes you kind of wave, but you don't, you know, somebody else might be watching us, so you just kind of wave down here so they don't see, you know, because you just want to wish them well. Um, somebody at, you know, somebody in the Walmart line in front of you after they checked out, that's when they decide to strike up a conversation with the uh, cashier. So you're just standing behind them waiting, going, man, they sure are awesome to be able to talk like that. You know, or, it, you know, this line's going fast till you get in and all of a sudden the person in front of you, they only have like 10 things in their cart, but they pull out 10 separate ad flyers for price matching and you're like, oh, sweet Lord, take me home now. Uh, you know, it, you get this little stuff that happens and then, you know, then what happens? You go out to eat, maybe something a little bit worse, your order gets wrong or they mess up or, or the wait staff is rude or something. So these bigger things happen and you're already on edge because of all that little stuff. And then all of a sudden what happens whenever you get sick or maybe your car got hit or then you, or you lose your job or something major happens. Your faith is already in shambles because we've allowed it to be taken out by these little things. We didn't strengthen ourselves in those little opportunities that were presented. We just, it sapped a little of our strength. It sapped a little more of our strength. And then we get to this point to where when the big thing happens and we need our faith in God to get us through that moment, it's not there. We just get rolled over and we get crushed by the enemy. And we're just like, oh, well, you know, okay, God, I know you're out there. And I guess, you know, I'm just suffering for you. Or, you know, you, know, you, you rescue some people, but not me. I guess this is going to be a testimony event or something like that. Where instead we have a chance to stand firm. But because we haven't been standing firm, we're not able to stand firm in that. So anyway, that's my story of the little things and how they can rob you. You know, afterwards, after I went through the lot, all of a sudden it looked clean, but I didn't, it was, it was, it looked dirty to me, but I could only see three or four things. And I got rid of those, and then I got rid of the others, and then I got rid of the others. And, you know, I'm sure you could go out there and say, Seth, you missed the bottle cap. You know, hey, there's this piece of paper. And this was months ago, so we've, we've had a new round of trash since then. So, um, so what are some of those little things that we allow to come between us? Like I say, they, they start off small, and if we're not ready, we don't, we don't know till the end. See, there's, um, this is some bonus content. This isn't in my notes here. But there's a lie that, um, that nobody ever says it, but we kind of believe it, that says, you know, hey, only perfect people get to stand up here. Only perfect people are leaders in the body of Christ. And so whenever we see a leader, somebody who's standing up preaching, when we find out they're human, just like us, we find, uh, we, we take shots at them and say, oh, well, God's not real because Christianity is a lie because look at that preacher. I, you know, I saw him out having a beer or, you know, they were cussing somebody out on the side of the road or whatever. And here's the thing. There was one perfect person who has lived on this planet. His name was Jesus and he died paying the price for the sin that I could never pay the price for. And he gave me his righteousness that I could never live right for. And that's me talking to myself, not preaching at y'all, but it is true for all of us. We are all humans and we all make mistakes and we all trip and fall over the stupidest little stuff and over the big stuff too. You know, there's all kinds of stuff to take all of us now. So I want to switch ahead now. And now page two, for those of you who heard Paul Harvey. Um, so this is Joshua chapter seven. This is showing you... Um, how sometimes what you do affects more than yourself. It affects other people. So Joshua chapter 7, start with verse 1. And these are, all these scriptures I'm giving you are from the New Living Translation because, you know, I had to pick a translation and that's the one I chose. Um, but Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Carmea, a descendant of Zimri, son of Zariah of the tribe of Judah. And that's an East Texan trying to pronounce words. Um, Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town of Ai, east of Bethel, near Beth-Avon. 
When they returned, they told, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack AI. Since there are so few of them, don't make all our people struggle to go up there. Can anybody just hear the pride dripping off of those words? They didn't know it at the time because we know there was a sin and Achan knew there was a sin, but Joshua didn't know there was sin in the camp. The other Israelites didn't know, so they, they sent out these spies and they came back and do their job. Hey, that's a little town. We just need a few people to go over there and we can mop that up and be back for dinner. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear at this turn of events, and their courage melted away. So somebody did something, led to some issues, and then those issues got bigger issues, and now all of a sudden, they're paralyzed with fear. Um, so Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothing. I'm not going to tear my clothing. Um, uh, in dismay, they threw dust on their heads. They bowed their face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening. Then Joshua cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan River if you're going to let the Amorites kill us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side. Lord, what can I say now that Israel has fled from its enemies? For when the Canaanites and all the other people living in the land hear about it, they will surround us and wipe our name off the face of the earth. And then what will happen to the honor of your great name? Now this is the same Joshua who led the people over the Jordan River when the priest touched it, the river, the water stopped, and the people crossed over on dry land. This is the same Joshua who led the men of war around Jericho. They marched around it once for six days, and on the seventh day, they marched seven times. They blew the trumpet, and the walls fell down. God took down the walls. And then they went up and defeated this city. Who had, the walls around it were so great that there could chariots race on top. It was a big place, and they didn't even have to lift a finger to defeat it. And now, this one little town beat them and all of a sudden God, we're all gonna die and then they're just they're 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 in fear that's not natural the fear has a supernatural thing and they're just they're they're crying out you know they're whining before god uh and i love i love you know sometimes i like the language the lord uses get up why are you lying on your face like this and he goes on to say, Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart from me. And they have not only stolen them, but have lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. That is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. Get up, command the people to purify themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, hidden among you, O Israel, or things are things set apart from the Lord. You will never defeat your enemies until you remove these things from among you. So this is, this was God's word to the people of Israel. And this is God's word still today. We wonder why we're in trouble why we're hard pressed, why we can't seem to get a moment's rest from, you know, from Satan, from accusation, from just strife, from conflict, from everything that's just tearing us apart. And the reason is there are things that God has ordered for destruction, but we're hiding them in our own lives. Hey, this is, uh, I'm not telling you to get up and say, you know, I've been having an affair with 17 people. You know, I do two lines of crack every day or anything like that. But there are things hidden in our life. And because we're okay with them being there, that means we're okay with God not having victory in our lives. We don't put it like that. We think, oh, well, you know, my dad was an alcoholic. His dad was an alcoholic. Two uncles on my mom's side were alcoholics. So I'm just an alcoholic. That's all there is to it. You know, everybody I know does drugs. I don't do as many as those. I don't do as many drugs as they do. I'm not as bad as them. So see, I'm good. There, there. The, we justify it to ourselves, but the fact of the matter is, there is sin in our life. 
And because there is sin in our life, we're, what we've done is we've, we've gone over to this door and we've unlocked it and we've opened up and we say, hey, sin, come on. Hey, Mr. Demon, why don't you, you and you, but not you. I'm not ready to go there. Why don't y'all come on in and uh, we'll see what happens. So I want to skip down to verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession and tell me what you have done. Don't hide. Don't hide it from me. Achan replied, it's true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than that. So Joshua sent some men to make a search. They ran to the tent and found the stolen goods hidden there, just as Achan has said, with the silver buried beneath the rest. So picture what it was like when they went into Achan's tent. There's this, there's this awesome garment, and there's like this bar of gold, and you can take that and you can run out and say, hey, look, we found it. And it's true, you found it, but you didn't find all of it. Buried underneath that was 200 pieces of silver. And what hap- I bet you what happened, Achan didn't say, he didn't find a backpack full of a garment, a bag of gold, and 200 coins. You know, you're going through and you find one coin. You're not quite in the city yet. You're just, crawl- you're just coming up to the wall. Oh, here's just one coin. I'm just going to take that one coin. Then you go on a little bit more, and here's a couple of more coins. You, they're not in the city. They're just on the road at the city gates. So you take those, and then you find some more coins here, and then you find some more coins there. And the next thing you know, you've got all of these silver coins. And then you find this bar of gold. Well, hey, you know, what's that compared to the silver? And then you find this garment. You know, it, it's just like Samuel and Saul, where Samuel told Saul, go kill everyone there kill everything there, leave nothing alive. And Saul went and he killed everyone except the king. He left nothing alive except for the really good ox and sheep. And then Samuel shows up and Saul's like, I have fulfilled the word of the Lord. And Samuel, well, what's this bleeding of sheep and oxen I hear? You know, because you don't set out to, well, God said to go there, so I'm going to disobey God and go there. No, you're going there, but then all of a sudden you look and say, oh, hey, I'm just going to take a pit stop here. And then you get going, and then you correct, you go too far. And the next thing you know, you totally messed up. But in your mind, you have fulfilled the word of the Lord. You didn't fulfill the word of the Lord. You fulfilled the word that you wanted to fulfill to say you fulfilled the word of the Lord. Your mind so twisted it up, so messed it up. And it all started with just this little piece of trash. You know, that, that's the thing. It's not the big stuff. Satan knows he's not going to take us out if he hits us with the big stuff first. Because we can see the big stuff coming. What he's going to do is he's going to hit us with the little thing. That we don't, we don't recognize that as sin because that's just the way we act. We don't recognize that as wrong because it's not as bad as other people do. As the Christians from the other church Let me tell you, you want want some rough people, I'm not as bad as them, so see, I'm following God. But what we don't realize is we took, we're still behind, we're still behind his protection, but now we're just, we're sort of behind his protection. And then we step out, and it's like, well, if you draw a line, see, I'm, uh, okay, okay, I'm still behind it. So see, I'm still behind, no, we're so far out of the way, we've missed it. We've lied to ourselves about what God has told us to do because we don't take his word for it. We look for somebody who will twist his word for us if we can't do it ourselves. You know, like for example, we in in Bible Belt, what's left of Bible Belt America, we have taken Christianity to mean don't drink. I mean, you know, let's not talk about the fact that Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine, not grape juice. Paul told Timothy, hey, if your stomach's feeling upset, it's okay to have a glass of wine. We, we, we say that was, that was unfermented grape juice. 
oh my gosh, y'all, I have read so pages and pages of people trying to jump through hoops and saying, well, if you look at the Greek word here, and then you go over here to this, it, there's this one place in ancient Greek where it didn't mean wine, it meant grape juice, and Paul knew that, and that's why I used that word. And I'm just like, people, it's okay. Sin is what God calls sin. It's not what we call sin. I think it was Howard that said years ago, sin is the stuff other people do wrong that I don't. If I do it, it's not sin. Come on, it's just, it's, it's life is hard and I'm doing the best I can. But it's not sin. It might not be perfect, but it's not wrong. What they're doing is wrong. Why does the church attack homosexuality and not adultery? Because for the most part, the church doesn't engage in homosexuality. But adultery runs rampant through the congregations all across this country. So we're not going to talk about that. That would get personal, and people might leave the church. And we need their offering because we don't trust God to provide for his finances. So we're not going to talk about the stuff that they do. We're going to talk about the stuff that somebody else does that we've never heard of. And we're going to call that sin. And we're all going to talk about how we're better than them. And how we're obeying the word of the Lord because we don't do that one thing. And see, Paul said it's the worst sin there is. Well, I mean, come on. Let's, let's grow up, people. And let's just find out what God is truly saying. And let's come back and let's stand on his word. And let's not stand on our word. Let's not find some, the one preacher out there who says something that we can get behind and ignore what the Bible says. Let's come back to the Bible. Let's come back to God. So, let me see. I talked about that. Like I say. Um, <laughs> so, because we've allowed it, we've allowed those little things to remain. When the big stuff comes, we don't have the strength to fight anymore. We're just like, I'm not going to fight that. I just can't. I'm just going to roll over. God saved my soul. I'll wind up in heaven when I die. You know, this earth is just toil and trouble and strife. And the Bible says those who endure to the end will be saved. So I'm just going to put my head down and take my beating because I know when I die, it's bonbons and cream cheese floating the clouds on high with harps and wings and fluttery stuff. So I got my mansions in glory waiting on me. But we forget that Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. He didn't say the kingdom of God is going to start after you die. The kingdom of God is here. And the reason our fights are hard is because we didn't fight. We didn't fight in the front lines. We let Satan run over us and trap us from our friends, from our family, from the rest of our body. I mean, it doesn't matter how strong your arm is. You can have Arnold Schwarzenegger biceps. But if I cut that off from your shoulder and put a sword in it and say fight, it's not going to do anything. It doesn't matter how fast your feet can move. If I cut you off at the knees, you're just going to writhe around in pain and beg for some relief. But here's the thing. I need y'all. And believe it or not, y'all need me too. So you can't run off and leave me alone. And I can't, I can't stay, you know, it, it's okay, it's true. You don't have to have anybody else to get saved and go to heaven. That's just you and Jesus. Don't let, you know. But here's the thing. If you want to live, if you want to live life, if you want to have joy, not happiness that is based on what happens to you, but the joy of the Lord overflowing you, coming up from within, those rivers of living water that the Bible testifies will come out of you in those situations, then you're going to have to have some friends close by that can man up to you and say, brother, you need to stop what you're doing because you're flat out wrong. And you know, and sometimes you've got to risk being, you have to love the truth more and you have to love somebody enough to say, if they kick me out of their life, I can't let them go down in flames. They've got to know the truth. Now, here's the thing. That, that's not license to go up and get into somebody's face and scream at them and say, you're going to go to hell. That's not it. You first, you better stop and you better find 
we'll have to clean out a closet because if you're like me, there's so much junk in every room in your house, there's no quiet place to go and pray. We need to find someplace quiet and we need to pray. And as we seek God, he's going to give us a burden for other people. And as we walk in that burden, Satan is going to fight back. Because, I mean, here's the thing, and you can agree with this or you can disagree with this. We're in a little bit of bonus time. I'm going to to wrap up pretty soon here. Um, I I love y'all. I I love this place. This, This place is more, brings more joy to me than my house does. I've come up here at 10, 11, 12 at night and just sit in the parking lot. You know, eat some Taco Bell and just pray and just pray for blessings for people. Pray for this place. But we have problems. This church has problems. And the problems didn't come in the door two weeks ago. They didn't come in the door six months ago. We've had problems in this church for years. And we've been okay with them being there. We've been okay with the strong man who is not God running this church. And we've just been, oh, well, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Okay, it's Sunday morning. I know it starts at 1030. But as long as I'm there by the preaching, it's okay. Uh, You know, we've allowed Satan to just rule our lives and to rule our church. This place, this group of people whom Jesus died for, he didn't die on the cross so that I could say I'm better than those people and I wish I could be a part of that group. And why doesn't that group get it together? And if those seven people back there would just leave, this would be a much better place. No, Jesus came so that we could have life. He came so that we could grow in the fellowship of him. There's just, I'm, I'm tired. Of, I tell you what, we, uh, if you want to come, if you want, if you want to put on some, some big boy britches, come to the Tuesday prayer meeting. <laughs> I tell you what, it, it's, um, Tuesday prayer meeting, it's, it's sort of like laundry. Dirty stuff gets brought up and it gets agitated and it gets spun around and beat out. But I tell you what, we come out of it cleaner than we've ever been. We come out of it with more peace among ourselves, greater fellowship that we need desperately. We need each other. We can't just hold on by ourselves. I, will, I, was, um, I was praying with, uh, trying to pray with Lacey some this week. And was having problems. I tell you, I, I, got, I woke up Friday with a headache. They just, the longer I was up, the worse it got. And my stomach started churning and saying, nothing's ever coming in here again. And I'm about to spew some stuff out. And I was like, no, I'm healed in Jesus' name. And before I could argue with myself, I went back to sleep. But in the, in the meantime, I had texted Lacey and just, you know, said, hey, you know, what's up? Tell me about this meeting tonight. And um, I went to sleep. Two hours later, I wake up. The texts are still on my phone. It still says sending, 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 sending. So wait, what do you, what's the first thing you do with a computer problem? You reboot the computer. Well, it's still sending, sending, sending. And finally, I looked at that phone. I just kind of took a minute. And I said, you know, either this stuff is real or this stuff isn't. And I commanded my phone to work in Jesus' name. And you can think this is stupid. You can think this is pointless, but I commanded those texts to be sent in Jesus' name. Now, you can say it's coincidence, but it just so happened that about two seconds after I prayed and I commanded it to work, then those texts went through. Because, you see, I am bent, and I have a problem. And my problem is I don't want to talk to nobody, and if nobody wants to talk to me, that's just fine. Y'all are there. I'm here. Hey, we're, we're part of the same family. I'm the crazy uncle that nobody wants to talk to. I I, I own that. So I was like, well, no, I don't want to own that. I want to be a part. Well, Satan is like, nah, you don't really want to be a part. You're just saying that now. Give it a minute. You'll pass. And I'm like, no, this is real. I'm desperate. You start fasting. I called a fast in the prayer meeting last Tuesday. Weird stuff happens. Weird stuff happens. Howard and I were talking in the office a couple of weeks ago and, you know, just talking about how there's problems in the church and what are we going to do? And he's like, well, you know, what are you willing to sacrifice? And I'm like, Howard, we're not to that point, are we? Can't we do something else besides sacrifice? I mean, look at me. 
If there's one person in this church who likes to eat, if you were going to take a look around, who would you say it is? I would at least make the finals. So I ended up fasting a couple of days and then a couple of more days this week. And I tell you what, it's amazing how much we begin to see God in our everyday life that we didn't see before because the little stuff was there. Fasting, you, you can fast and walk around, make you a cafe press shirt that says, I'm fasting, look how holy I am. Ain't nothing gonna happen. No, I didn't tell anybody I was fasting the first day I did it. I just woke up with such a burden for the church and a burden for us. There's like, something's gotta change. And I can't say somebody else has to change. Something has to change in me. And I need to see God clearly. I need some power in my spiritual walk. You know, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the, yeah, that one starts with an S, so we don't talk about it much. But self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's sometimes saying no to my belly. My belly knows how to talk to me, and it gets loud, and other people hear my belly talking. But I decided that, you know, I would rather hear from God like that than my belly. I, would, I want to long for God the way my stomach was longing for some food. And when I broke my fast and got something to eat, cheap fast food. Never tasted anything so good in my life. Oh my gosh, it was awesome. But here's the thing. You, you're changed and you're coming alive and you're shaking off this little stuff. Am I perfect now? Oh, look at Seth. He's fasted. Woo! No, I still have struggles. I still fall. The little stuff still trips me up. But now I kind of notice it on the way down. And God catches me. And I get back up. And here's the thing. God paid the... God, when God saved me, he knew all the stuff I already did. And he knew all the stuff I was going to do after he saved me. And he still said, Seth, you're worth it. Amen. So it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter. Oh, well, you know, I, I can't talk about God today because I cussed my kids out this morning. Well, I mean, if, if that's all it takes, you know, I mean, sometimes saying I'm sorry to people as well as to God, you want to bring some healing, go, go tell somebody I was wrong. Not that Seth was wrong. <laughs> you, use the word I, you can tell them I was wrong because I've been wrong a lot. But go to admit someone where you were wrong, where you were messed up, and trust God. I mean, would we rather pretend like everything is okay, or would we rather bring up the dirt so it can get clean? I want to bring up the dirt so it can get clean. It's not fun when it happens, but looking back, I'd rather walk around in clean clothes than dirty clothes. And you know what happens when you wear clothes? They get dirty again, and you have to wash them. Okay. So... Bonus scripture for you to look up if you want to, Matthew 12, 22 through 30. It's about the strong man. How can you enter a house uh, and plunder it unless you first bind the strong man? So um, spiritual warfare is real. We all know God's real or we wouldn't be here. I'd rather be sleeping. It's a great day for it. But here's the thing. If God is real, angels are real, demons are real. So I'm, I'm, I'm tired of them winning. I mean, I want the victory that Jesus has promised, that Jesus has already won. I mean, that's the thing. Jesus has won the victory. And we just get a chance to look at Satan and say, he won, you get out. And Satan's going to say no. And then there's going to be a fight. But you know what? Jesus won. And he'll win again. Because he, the last time I checked, Jesus is undefeated. Satan's the one who lost. It looked like Jesus was going to lose for about three days, but then that turned out to be the greatest victory in the history of the universe. So if it looks like we're going to lose, guess what? That just means it's going to be the greatest victory in the history of driven life. I believe in revival. I'm praying for revival. I'm praying for hearts to get changed, and I'm starting with my heart because I know I'm not where I need to be. Satan just comes and whips on me, but now I'm getting to the point where I'm saying that's enough. I'll let Jesus beat on you some. And you know what? It's worth it. It's hard, but what's on the other side is worth what you have to go through to get there. So please come with me and let's win this one. 
not for the Gipper, but let's win it for the Savior because there's, there's hundreds and thousands of people who are outside these walls who need, desperately need. I mean, we know the truth, and look at how desperate we need Jesus to get through our lives. What about the people who don't know the truth? How much more desperate are they if they don't have anywhere to cope? So anyway, that's my message. I love y'all. If anybody needs prayer, come on up. I'll be up here. Howard will be up here. Jason will be up here. Um, if you need prayer, come on. We want to pray because we want to see, we want to see us win. I want to see us win. So I love you. And God loves you. Let me pray, and then we'll be dismissed.